Hi, this is Pat Love with Pat's Two Cents, and we are reading John chapter 1, verse 1 throughout. Now, this is God's Church of Love meeting every Saturday. It would be nice if some of you joined us. God bless you. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, before I go any further, anytime you see in print, in the beginning was the word, you notice it's capitalized. The W is capitalized. You will see as I read on who that's referring to. So when you want to call Jesus a prophet, he is more than that baby. He is the son of God. He is God incarnate, which means God with us in the flesh. He is God. Now, in the beginning was the Word, that's Jesus. And the Word, that's Jesus, was with God. That's all the way in the beginning. He was with God. And the Word was God. Now, that settles that about who Jesus is, his deity. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him, was not anything made that was made. Which means anything that exists, that's from the angels above to the demons and the devil below, it's all made by God. Hell itself was made by God. All right, now, all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the light was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, the light is capitalized, by the way, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. What is that name? The name of Jesus. All right, now, verse 13. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word, here it is right here. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received in grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man that has seen God at any time, excuse me, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Father, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. And this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Okay, now we're not going to go any further, but I just want to share who Jesus is, who God is. They are one. All right, now if I were to paint a picture, when Jesus was born when God spoke the word into Mary's womb through the 
overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. The word became flesh. It became flesh. It was like God came, put on a body, came in the form of a baby. Now the Godhead was still in control, but now he had to send a part of him down into this baby. And this baby had to grow and develop. This is a form of picture a king, a powerful king. And he's got a great domain, a great kingdom, a great realm. And he wants to relate to his people. All he knows is his palace. He knows his people, but he wants to relate. And he wants his people to relate to him and understand him as well. So what he does is he comes down takes off his crown, takes off his robe, all of his royalty uh, goodies. And he comes down and he becomes a common man. And people don't recognize him because he looks common like everyone else. A common man doing common things, living a common, regular, everyday, normal lifestyle. And now he becomes more acquainted with the struggles of them and they become more acquainted with the heart of the king once he reveals himself as who he really is. But first, he lives amongst his people. He lives like his people. He dwells like his people. So the relationship goes both ways. He relates. That's why the Bible says he is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Now, and he is in all points tempted like as we, but without sin. So the beautiful part is we have a king that can relate to his people. We have a king that was willing to sacrifice everything for his people, for his creation. That's love. And it's also, it shows you the power and dominion of God. Everything that he created, everything that is, he created. So he is above it all, no matter what any of you on YouTube dabble in, the witchcraft, the demons, the devils, the, the witches, the warlocks, the spirits, the hexes, the spells, or your, the, all the little incantations, the astrology gazes, the, the people who live by the zodiac, people who are caught up in religion, ritualistic, legalized religion. All of this is under, under the authority of God, which means no matter what you do, you will never outdo God. You will never outpower God. You will never outsmart God. God is all it, baby. God said, I created good and I create evil. I do all these things. God is the head honcho, whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, God is the head honcho. You born again Christians, stop turning tail and running from these demons. You have God on your side. And trust me, you're way more important than a little demon is. God will come to your rescue, but you have to believe in him more than you believe in them. And some of you born again Christians believe that these demons have more power and they don't. You believe the devil has more power and he does not. Anytime any one of us born again Christians confronts a devil, any one of us confronts the devil and we rebuke him in the name of Jesus. We praise the Lord. We speak the word. We have authority over the demon. The demon flees. God doesn't run when a demon shows up. God doesn't run when the devil attacks you. No, the devil runs when you resist him in the name of Jesus. The demons flee when you resist them in the name of Jesus. However you resist them, through rebuking them, through plain obedience, through reading God's word out loud to them or quoting his word to them, through praising God, whatever, 
The bottom line is you in God, in Christ Jesus, you have authority over them. You have authority over your body. You have authority over your circumstances, over your realm of influence. You have authority. You see something breaking out in the store. This is the power that dwells in you. You see something breaking out in the store. You don't have a weapon in your hand. You don't have a knife. You don't have a badge to stop illegal actions. But you see a, a fight breaking out. You can stand there and whisper under your breath, I bind you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. Take that crap outside of this door. Nobody will get hurt in here. In Jesus' name. I shut that down. I bind the spirit of violence. I bind the spirit of murder in the name of Jesus. Bind that mess. Take authority wherever you are. You don't have to say it out loud. You can whisper. It ain't the people you're talking to. It's the demons that are manipulating them. Demons can hear a whisper. They can hear a mumble. God makes sure of that because God made them. You have to remember who God is in your life. God is the ultimate authority, baby. Not your little candle spells or your little idols or your little things, your little Buddhism and, and, your, and your little idols sitting around. I was trying to share with a woman years ago, trying to get her to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. She told me she would only accept him on one condition. And I said, oh, <laughs> really now? I mean, I thought that. I was nice. I said, oh, really? I said, what? And she said, I want to be able to keep all my idols. And I told her, I said, you won't need your idols when you have God. You will not need them. <laughs> you don't need them now. But I didn't say that. I wasn't going to be insulting. But think about that. She really thought that a man-made little statue would have more power than the God who made her. What sense does that make? Think about that. See, the problem with this world and the problem with many born-again Christians is we do not know who God really is. And some of us, as we're learning to get to know him, we're in the process of learning who he is. We're not convinced yet, but we are at least in hot pursuit. But many of you out there are not even pursuing God and you don't know him and you're not trying to know him because you got your cell phones with your selfies, you got your songs, you got your movies, you got your Facebook, you got your social media, you can go on this and talk to that, you can look at this over there, you can get all the gossip you want, you can look at all the X-rated dirty stuff you want, you can look at all of the gossip about the about the celebrities, you can hear all about Beyonce and boo-boo and blah, blah, that and whatever. And you got all these idols in your life. All these idols that are crowding your life. And you won't pursue God and then you get frustrated because you don't know him. Don't get frustrated with God. That's not on him. God responds to hunger. If you open your mouth, picture it. If you open your mouth and I've got a big feast of food and you're saying I'm so hungry and I've got the fork, the spoon, everything that I can just put the food in your mouth, automatically I'm going to feed you. Let's say you're in the hospital. You can't feed yourself. And I'm taking care of you. Yeah, I'm going to feed you. That's automatic. Well, this is what God does. When he sees hunger in your soul, when he pictures, when he senses that longing in you, it draws him. Your longing is the magnet that draws God to you. 
That's why the Bible says he will manifest himself to you. But the hunger that's in you, if you don't have it, ask God to give you the hunger. He stacks the whole deck in your favor, but you got to keep asking. Ask God to draw you, to put in you that, that hunger and thirst for him. A hunger and thirst to want to get to him, get to know him more personally, one-on-one -on -one experience, supernatural encounter with your God. You can have it. It's yours for the taking. But you must ask, you must persist, you must repeatedly insist, and you must pursue. You pursue God through reading your word. You pursue God through talking to him when you don't have anything to say. Just ask God, what do you want in my life? If you don't have a whole bunch of requests, thank him for the things that you know he had to have done in your life, even if you're not sure. Thank him. Give him all the credit. Give him all the credit because it's in him that we live, we move, we have our being. It's in him. When you are getting to know God, you want to make sure you want to make sure that you are in a position that you can always get God's attention. Now, you're walking with God. You're getting to know him. You're not exactly sure about everything about him. You're not even sure if you agree with everything in his word. Well, that's natural because our flesh always is diametrically opposed to spirit. That's just automatic. So we have to pray that God readjusts us to him. But remember, the main thing we need to get to know is God himself. Who are you, Lord? Ask him questions. Lord, what do you like? What do you not like? What do you like about me? What do you not like about me? Do you have plans for my life? Lord, you see all this stuff that I'm dealing with. Would you heal me? Would you heal my hurts? Lord, would you work this out for me? Would you work that out for me? Um, uh, show me scripture that describes who you are in my life. You know, I, 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 I'm not quite sure how I believe in this thing. I'm, I'm not really that convinced. And when I talk, I feel like I'm talking to midair. And, I, you know, people say they love you. Well, I don't love you, Lord, because I don't know you. I mean, I, I want to get to know you. Who are you? I want you to be my father. I want you to be my best friend. I, I want you to be my counselor. My Prince of Peace, like the Bible says, I want you to be all that to me, but I don't want to just believe it. I want to know it. I want to go beyond belief and know that I've touched the, the heart of God, the God that you have touched my heart and we're really one. And, and ah, you must pursue God. Listen, listen to this. Picture yourself dating somebody. This is just a date. We're not even talking marriage. Dating. And sometimes part of our walk with the Lord, especially at the beginning, goes through a courtship before we actually lock in. Even though we've said the I do's, even in marriage, you go through that little honeymoon period. You're still courting each other at the beginning of your marriage because you're still getting to know each other as good at bad points. Okay, and you're adjusting to each other. You're getting to understand each other. That takes time. That's not at the time you say, I do. No, no. The real nitty-gritty hits once you say, I do. You're getting to know each other. So you go from courtship to engagement to the honeymoon period. All that time, you're getting to know one another. The whole time, that whole thing. And... That is basically what's happening with the Lord. When you first give your heart to the Lord, you're just now 
getting to know him. He's worth knowing, y'all. He's worth knowing. And as you get to know him, there comes a part, just like when you're getting to know your mate, there comes a part where your pride has to go to the side. You cannot have a successful marriage or a successful relationship with your pride all the way in the way. That's why narcissistic people ruin relationships because they're so full of themselves. They're so self-centered. They're so, uh, they're so full of self-worship that they cannot put another person's needs first. They're too selfish. They're too caught up in me, myself, and I. I worship me. I'm all about me. Well, what about me? Well, have you thought about me? Well, I'm thinking about me. And when you have that kind of a mindset, it's difficult to open up to a person, let alone God. Because God says, deny yourself. Those are the exact words of Jesus. Deny yourself. If, you, if you're willing to lose your life for my sake, hello. But if you want to save your life for your sake, you've lost out on me. So you want to make sure that you are not putting yourself before God. But that comes over time. That's a process. Right now, you're heading up that parade and you're trying to worship God. God's back here and you're in the front. You're trying to readjust and get your position right, but you're still trying to learn that, that priority there. You're, you're trying to learn that. God gives you time. He understands that part. But be about doing it. Pursue that. And one way that you will readjust your mind, you will renew your mind, Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. And that renewal takes place as you learn your walk with the Lord, as you learn him, as you get to know his heart, as you get to know his ways, you get to know his mind. How do you learn that? You read from Genesis all the way up. People want to throw out the Old Testament because of legalism. But the Old Testament is not for legalism for us. We're in the dispensation of grace. The Old Testament will teach you who God is. For example, let me give you some examples. You've got Genesis. Okay. What did God do when Adam and Eve sinned? After he went through all the cursing and everything else and curse shall be the ground, blah, blah, blah. Well, that was man's doing. So he warned him, okay, you did it. So here are the consequences. But what did he do after he laid down the law? And I mean, after he laid down their booty whooping forever, he covered them with fig leaves. Even though God chastises you, he covers you. That's his love. That's his heart. When God uh, brings judgment, All participants are muted and they can unmute themselves. When God brings judgment, what he ends up doing is with the judgment, there's always mercy mixed with judgment. Always. Always. There's something, I mean, even though he judges you, he will say, but if you turn to me, 
Just turn back to me with your all your heart. What does the Bible say in 2 Chronicles 7, 14? If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, turn from it, then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. That's a merciful God right there, y'all. He's merciful. He's understanding. The Bible says he's a long-suffering baby. Ah, oh, get to know your God. Get to know the lover of your soul, the lifter up of your head. Get to know your shield, your buckler, the horn of salvation, your high tower, your rear guard. Your, oh, get to know him. Get to know him. You got to know him through his word. When I first was getting acquainted with God, it was through the Bible. I was reading God's Bible. And then when I got to the New Testament and saw the words of Jesus, I really got to know his spirit, his attitude towards his people. But the Old Testament was great because it had all these symbols. I'm telling you, it all comes together to get you acquainted with God. It all comes together. There were things I didn't know about my own mother till I read some of her words written in a book she had tucked away. You get to know God through word, through his power, through the authority he has over the works of darkness. You get to know God through the interventions and the miracles he works in your life. You get to know God through the things that are changing inside of you that you know you didn't do yourself. You get to know God through his faithfulness. You get to know God. As Davina said, if you lack understanding, then ask, and he will give it liberally. Listen, you guys, God is, he understands what you don't know. He doesn't hold all that you don't know against you. He gives you time to get to know. <clears throat> but you must pursue. <coughs> Excuse me. You must pursue. You must pursue him. <gasps> Excuse me. Pursue him like, like the man who is pursuing that woman that he wants so bad. He buys her flowers. He, he calls her. He tries to have lunch with her. And then he tries to have dinner with her. And then he wants to hear her voice over the phone. He wants to to be close to her. He wants that intimacy. He loves the cologne she wears. He loves her scent. He loves looking at her. He loves hearing her voice. He just can't get enough of her. When was the last time you felt that way about God? When was the last time you wanted to hurry up and get home so you and God could be alone together? Hmm. That starts to happen once you connect personally with God. Connect, you guys, connect. Do whatever you can. Now, some of you will have to turn your cell phones off. Power them suckers down. That'll be beneficial because that'll stop all those microwave uh, signals from floating all over your house and all over your body. Turn that thing off and that kills that right there. You don't even have to wrap it up in aluminum foil. Turn it off. Give God time. Give God your attention. 
God rules everything. He's got all authority. Whatever your situation is, whatever your dilemma is, whatever your challenge is, whatever your problem is, whatever your, your, your conflict is, God has the answer and he has the power to give you victory over it all and raise you up above all your enemies, all your circumstances, all your problems. He has all authority over everything, even your boss, even your paycheck, even the president of the United States. Duh, believe it or not. Yeah. Even the king of England, the queen of England, the this, the, the prince or whatever, all these provinces. He's got authority over all. He had this one king got so mad at him because the king decided to take all the glory and not give it to God. God said, okay, I'll fix your business, buddy. You're going to be crawling around out there in the desert looking like a fool. You won't know you're behind from a hole in the wall. You won't even know your own name. You'll be cuckoo as a, as a cuckoo bird. Mm -hmm. When I get through with you, you'll be back right. That's just what he did. Took a king, dethroned him, and sent him out like a madman. God has power. Some of you praying about the government, pray that God convinces these leaders. Pray that God moves on and puts the fear of God in them so they forget. They don't forget that God is God and they're mere men because a lot of them think they're gods. They think it. They really do. And a lot of them worship the devil too. So what I'm trying to tell you is you need to pray to God. That's your answer. Not President Trump, not President Obama, not President Clinton, not Hillary Clinton, not this one, that one, or the other one. It's all God, baby. He is the bottom line, and he is the top poncho. Trust me. You're looking all in the wrong sources when you look to anything else other than God to handle your situation, to handle you. Oh, okay. The best way I can say this is pursue God through prayer, confession, honest repentance, confession, but repentance is not complete. Confession is the beginning of the repentance. The repentance is complete once you do an about face and you head the other direction and leave what you repented of behind you. Walk away from it. Cut it loose like a gangrenous leg. Prayer, repentance, reading God's word, obedience to God's word, Spending time in his presence, listening. Listen, ask God to speak to your spirit. Ask God to shower you with his love and his presence, his peace, his comfort, his encouragement, whatever it is you need. Take authority and watch how powerful God's name is. And if his name is that powerful, how much more is he himself? God bless you as you go on hot pursuit for the God, the Word, and the Holy Spirit that are at the top of the whole creation chain. That they are it, the head, not the tail. If he's the head, he makes us the head. Anyway, God bless you. I hope that helped you get a clearer view as to who you're serving, who some of you are rebelling against. Understand, yeah, you can go with everything else below, but you're going for sub, sub baby. You are... I mean, you are settling so low. You're stooping so low to settle when you've got Almighty God that's ready, willing, and eager and able to be on your side and work on your behalf. 
But no, you rather have that. Like that East Indian woman told me, I can only take them if I can keep my idols. Well, keep your idols, baby, because God is not going to be one of your lovers. It ain't happening like that. And he's not going to do that for any of us either. You love your cell phone or you love God. You love your computer or you love God. You love TV or you love God. You love your man or you love God. You love your woman or you love God. You love your kids or you love God. I know it sounds hard, but he must come first. He must come first. Above all, even above you, he must come first. There are times when you're walking with God, he will tell you no. And you be mad at him. Oh, yeah, I'm going to tell you right now. You'll be mad at him because he said no, because you can't have your way, because your flesh wants to have its way. Well, you're human, but what are you going to do about that? Now what are you going to do? Now the ball is in your part. You going to sit there and do it God's way, or you going to be a fool and have it your way? Now you know who's first by who you obey. Who is first in your life? God or you and yours? Who's first? God bless you as you ponder on that question. All participants are unmuted. <laughs> 